10 Strangest World War II Unsolved Mysteries World War II was the most widespread and bloody war in history, with upwards of 85 million fatalities between 1939 and 1945. Much is known about the key men involved in the war, notably Adolf Hitler, Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stalin, and about both the opposing Allied and Axis powers. In fact, the Second World War is one of the most discussed and talked about events in human history, with countless books, films, and TV series about an event that directly affected the majority of the world's population. Despite the wealth of information that is available on World War II, and the various operations involved within it, some mysteries still remain a full seven decades after its conclusion. The whereabouts of the Fuhrer Globe owned by Adolf Hitler and made famous by Charlie Chaplin in his 1940 film The Great Dictator, is unknown for example. Furthermore, what exactly were the mysterious UFOs that appeared during the conflict that became known as the Foo Fighters? Also, the legend of the Bermuda Triangle was given much fuel by the mystery disappearance of Flight 19 in the aftermath of the Second World War. Here are the 10 weirdest and most bizarre unsolved mysteries from World War II, and be warned, some of them are extremely for 1. The Foo Fighters Most people may know the Foo Fighters as a Seattle rock band founded by Nirvana drummer Dave Grohl, but the term was actually first used by Allied aircraft pilots, during the Second World War to describe unidentified flying objects, UFOs. Originally coined by the U.S. 415th Night Fighter Squadron, to report any UFO sightings during World War II, it became formal military language from November 1944. As well as referring to UFOs spotted over the European and Pacific battlefields, the term could also be applied to any mysterious aerial phenomena, such as the strange objects flying past the planes in the picture above. Toward the end of World War II, mission updates from the 415th Night Fighter Squadron took a mysterious turn. Along with details of dogfights over the German-occupied Rhine Valley, pilots began reporting inexplicable lights following their aircraft. One night in November 1944, a Bristol Bay fighter crew, pilot Edward Schluter, radar observer Donald J. Myers and intelligence officer Fred Ringwald was flying along the Rhine north of Strasbourg. They described seeing 8 to 10 bright orange lights off the left wing dot flying through the air at high speed. Neither the airborne radar nor ground control registered anything nearby. Schlutter turned toward the lights and they disappeared, the report continued. Later they appeared farther away. The display continued for several minutes and then disappeared. Myers gave these objects a name, taking a nonsense word used by characters in the popular Smoky Stover firefighter cartoon, Foo Fighters. Reports kept coming in. The objects flew alongside aircraft at 200 miles per hour, they were red, or orange, or green, they appeared singly or with as many as 10 others in formation, and they often outmaneuvered the airplanes they were chasing. They never showed up on radar. Richard Seibart historian for the nearby 417th Night Fighter Squadron, heard many of the stories directly from the 415th crew members, the pilots were very professional. They gave the report, talked about the lights, but didn't speculate about them. Still, the pilots found the sightings unnerving. Scared shitless was how a 415th pilot described feeling to Keith Chester, author of Strange Company military encounters with UFOs in World War II. At the end of the year, an Associated Press war correspondent, Robert C. Wilson, celebrated New Year's Eve with the 415th. The next day, his story on the Foo Fighters was featured on the front page of newspapers across the country. Other squadrons had seen them, but it was the number, consistency, and impact on the 415th crews and the fact that a reporter listened to the airmen, that finally prompted investigations into the sightings. Amateur psychologists, military aviation buffs, and conspiracy theorists offered explanations, but none that the airmen found credible. They didn't believe they were hallucinating because of battle fatigue. And because the lights caused no damage, 
The pilots doubted they came from remote-controlled German secret weapons. Street Elmo's fire, a discharge of light from sharp objects in electrical fields, seemed unlikely, since the Foo Fighters exhibited such extreme maneuverability. Eventually, the Army Air Command sent officers to investigate, but their research was lost after the war, Chester reported. In 1953, the CIA convened a panel of six top scientists familiar with experimental aviation technology to determine if the lights constituted a national security threat. The Robertson panel, named for its chair, Caltech physicist Howard P. Robertson, offered no official conclusion. Zy Bart, the historian, offered no explanation either, only an insight. I think the Foo Fighters didn't show up on radar because they were plain light, he said. Radar had to have a solid object. If there was any bogey out there, the pilots would absolutely be able to tell. Author Renato Vesco remained convinced that it was a Nazi secret weapon, however, and claimed Foo Fighters were a ground-launched automatically guided jet-propelled flak mine named the Foo Herbal, although nothing was ever proven. It is unlikely that the definitive explanation will ever be found, too. The fate of Raoul Wallenberg in the waning days of World War II, 1939-1945, Raoul Wallenberg, 1912, c. 1947, a Swedish businessman turned diplomat based in Budapest, was responsible for the rescue of thousands some estimates, are as high as 100,000 of Hungarian Jews, from extermination by the Nazis. Wallenberg handed out protective passports and set up safe houses for Jews, among other life-saving measures. In January 1945, he was detained by Soviet forces for reasons unknown, somewhere outside of Budapest, and never heard from again. Years later, Soviet officials admitted to taking Wallenberg into custody, but stated he had died of a heart attack in a Moscow prison in 1947. In the ensuing decades, Various sources claim that Wallenberg was still alive and being held by the Russians. While his exact fate remains a mystery, Raoul Gustav Wallenberg is considered a humanitarian hero of World War II, having saved up to 60,000 Jews from Nazi-occupied Hungary during the Holocaust, offering them fake passports and shelter, as well as providing food, soup kitchens, and hospitals to those threatened with death camps. Yet when the Soviets advanced through Eastern Europe, liberating the region country by country, the Swedish businessman was arrested by the Red Army, during the siege of Budapest on suspicion of espionage. Although the Soviets claimed that Wallenberg had died in his cell at the KGB's La Bianca prison on July 17, 1947, this account appears flimsy at best. Their explanatory document read, I report that the prisoner Wallenberg who is well known to you, died suddenly in his cell this night, probably as a result of a heart attack or heart failure. Pursuant to the instructions given by you that I personally have Wallenberg under my care, I request approval to make an autopsy with a view to establishing cause of death. I have personally notified the minister, and it has been ordered that the body be cremated without autopsy. Most remain unconvinced by this explanation and in 1991 the Russian government asked Vyacheslav Nikonov to investigate Wallenberg's death. The investigation concluded that the Swede was likely executed at La Bianca in 1947, possibly via the C2 poison, carbolamines choline chloride, that was being tested by the Soviet secret services at the time, and that was why the body was cremated pre-autopsy. As the decades passed, Various unconfirmed reports from released Soviet prisoners, and others surfaced regarding Wallenberg's fate, with some claiming the Swedish humanitarian was still alive and in Soviet custody. By the late 1970s, and early 1980s, Wallenberg's heroism and the mystery surrounding his disappearance had earned international notoriety. Believing him to still be living, some humanitarian organizations and individuals, including many whose lives were spared because of his valor, spearheaded a movement to have him released by the Russians and relocated to the U.S. In the meantime, Wallenberg was showered with worldwide tributes. In 1981, U.S. President Ronald Reagan, 1911-2004, to 2004, 
signed legislation naming Wallenberg an honorary American citizen, a mark of distinction that until that time had been earned only by Winston Churchill, 1874 to 1965. In 1991, Boris Yeltsin, 1931 to 2007, the Russian president, formed a commission to investigate the Wallenberg case. No new evidence was unearthed. Four years later, a bust of Wallenberg was displayed in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. In 1997, the U.S. Postal Service honored Wallenberg by issuing a stamp featuring his likeness. In December 2000, Russia officially admitted Soviet forces had wrongfully held Wallenberg out of Soviet prison, according to the New York Times. However, Russia's announcement did not provide any definitive details about the cause of the diplomat's death. According to the Times, it is generally accepted that Wallenberg was executed in 1947 in a Soviet prison. 3. Adolf Hitler's Fuhrer Globe The Fuhrer Globe or the Columbus Globe for state and industry leaders was a globe specifically designed for Nazi leader Adolf Hitler, although his most prized one has never been discovered. Made famous by Charlie Chaplin throwing about an inflatable replica in The Great Dictator, Hitler commissioned at least two expensive globes, with wooden bases to be made by the Columbus factory, but the one he kept in the new Reich Chancellery was never found by the Allies. Replicas and other Nazi globes exist, including some with Germany bullet holed, almost certainly by Soviet or American soldiers, but the iconic Hitler globe has an unknown whereabouts. Soviet Minister of Internal Affairs Lavrenti Iberia was the first to inspect the Reich Chancellery once the Red Army had captured Berlin, and it is possible that he took the globe to the KGB headquarters at Lubyanka. It could still remain there, but the KGB, and now the FSB, refused to confirm or deny this. Interestingly, a globe was discovered by an American soldier among the ruins of Hitler's Eagle's Nest complex near the Bavarian Alps, although it is believed to be too small to have been the Führer globe. This globe was sold for £68,000, $100,000, in 2007, but exactly what happened to the Hitler globe will almost certainly never be known. 4. Flight 19's Disappearance Over the Bermuda Triangle The Bermuda Triangle's reputation as a boat and plane-devouring chasm was first sealed in December 1945, when a group of five U.S. Navy Avenger torpedo bombers known as Flight 19 vanished in the Atlantic off the coast of Florida. No sign of the Avengers was ever found, and the Navy seaplane sent to rescue them also disappeared without a trace. Take a look back at one of the most perplexing mysteries in aviation history. It began as nothing more than a routine training flight. At 2.10 p.m. on December 5, 1945, five TBM Avenger torpedo bombers took off from a naval air station in F.T. Lauderdale, Florida. The planes collectively known as Flight 19 were scheduled to tackle a three-hour exercise, known as Navigation Problem No. 1. Their triangular flight plan called for them to head east from the Florida coast, and conduct bombing runs at a place called Hanson Chickens Shoals. They would then turn north and proceed over Grand Bahama Island, before changing course a third time and flying southwest back to base. Save for one plane that only carried two men, each of the Avengers was crewed by three Navy men or Marines, most of whom had logged around 300 hours in the air. The flight's leader was Lt. Charles C. Taylor, an experienced pilot and veteran of several combat missions in World War II a specific theater. At first, Flight 19's hop proceeded just as smoothly as the previous 18 that day. Taylor and his pilots buzzed over hands and check and shoals around 2.30 p.m. and dropped their practice bombs without incident. But shortly after the patrol turned north for the second leg of its journey, something very strange happened. For reasons that are still unclear, Taylor became convinced that his Avengers compass was malfunctioning and that his planes had been flying in the wrong direction. The troubles only mounted after a front blew in and brought rain, gusting winds and heavy cloud cover. Flight 19 became hopelessly disoriented. I don't know where we are, one of the pilots said over the radio. We must have got lost after that last turn. 
Lieutenant Robert F. Cox, another Navy flight instructor who was flying near the Florida coast, was the first to overhear the patrol's radio communications. He immediately informed the air station of the situation, and then contacted the Avengers to ask if they needed assistance. Both my compasses are out and I'm trying to find FT. Lauderdale, Florida, Taylor said, his voice sounding anxious. I'm overland, but it's broken. I'm sure I'm in the Keys, but I don't know how far down. Taylor's claim didn't seem to make sense. He'd made his scheduled pass over hands and chicken shoals in the Bahamas less than an hour earlier, but he now believed his planes had somehow drifted hundreds of miles off course and ended up in the Florida Keys. The 27-year-old had just transferred to Fort Lauderdale from Miami, and many have since speculated that he may have confused some of the islands of the Bahamas for the Keys. Under normal circumstances, pilots lost in the Atlantic were supposed to point their planes toward the setting sun and fly west toward the mainland, but Taylor had become convinced that he might be over the Gulf of Mexico. Hoping to locate the Florida Peninsula, he made a fateful decision to steer Flight 19 northeast, a course that would only take them even farther out to sea. Some of his pilots seemed to have recognized that he was making a mistake. Damn it, one man griped over the radio. If we would just fly west, we would get home. Taylor was eventually persuaded to turn around and head west, but shortly after 6 p.m., he seems to have cancelled the order and once again changed direction. We didn't go far enough east, he said, still worried that he might be in the Gulf. We may as well just turn around and go east again. His pilots probably argued against the decision some investigators even believed that one plane broke off and flew in a different direction but most followed their commander's lead. Flight 19's radio transmissions soon became increasingly faint as it meandered out to sea. When fuel began to run low, Taylor was heard prepping his men for a potential crash landing in the ocean. All planes close up tight, he said. We'll have to ditch unless landfall. When the first plane drops below 10 gallons, we all go down together. A few minutes later, the Avengers' last radio communications were replaced by an eerie buzz of static. The Navy immediately scrambled search planes to hunt for the missing patrol. Around 7.30 p.m., a pair of PBM Mariner flying boats took off from an air station north of FT. Lauderdale. Just 20 minutes later, however, one of them seemed to follow Flight 19's lead by suddenly vanishing off radar. The remains of the Mariner and its 13 crewmen were never recovered, but it's commonly believed that the seaplane exploded shortly after takeoff. Flying boats were notoriously accident-prone, and were even nicknamed flying gas tanks for their propensity for catching fire. Suspicions that the seaplane may have gone up in flames were all but confirmed by a passing merchant ship, which spotted a fireball and found evidence of an oil slick in the ocean. At first light the next day, the Navy dispatched more than 300 boats and aircraft to look for Flight 19 and the missing Marinor. The search party spent five days combing through more than 300,000 square miles of territory to no avail. They just vanished, Navy Lieutenant David White later recalled. We had hundreds of planes out looking, and we searched over land and water for days, and nobody ever found the bodies or any debris. A Navy Board of Investigation was also left scratching its head. While it argued that Taylor might have confused the Bahamas for the Florida Keys after his compasses malfunctioned, it could find no clear explanation for why Flight 19 had become so disoriented. Its members eventually attributed the loss to causes or reasons unknown. The strange events of December 5, 1945 have since become fodder for all manner of wild theories and speculation. In the 1960s and 70s, pulp magazines and writers such as Vincent Gaddis and Charles Berlitz helped popularize the idea that Flight 19 had been gobbled up by the Bermuda Triangle, a section of the Atlantic supposedly known for its high volume of freak disappearances and mechanical failures. Other books and fictional portrayals have suggested that magnetic anomalies, parallel dimensions and alien abductions might have all played a role in the tragedy. In 1977, 
The film Close Encounters of the Third Kind famously depicted Flight 19 as having been whisked away by flying saucers and later deposited in the deserts of Mexico. Even if the Lost Patrol didn't fall victim to the supernatural, there's no denying that its disappearance was accompanied by many oddities and unanswered questions. Perhaps the strangest of all concerns Lt. Taylor. Witnesses later claimed that he arrived to Flight 19's pre-exercise briefing several minutes late and requested to be excused from leading the mission. I just don't want to take this one out, he supposedly said. Just why Taylor tried to get out of flying remains a mystery, but it has led many to suggest that he may have not been fit for duty. Also unexplained is why none of the members of Flight 19 made use of the rescue radio frequency or their plane's ZBX receivers, which could have helped lead them toward Navy radio towers on land. The pilots were told to switch the devices on, but they either didn't hear the message or didn't acknowledge it. What really happened to Flight 19? The most likely scenario is that the planes eventually ran out of gas and ditched in the ocean somewhere off the coast of Florida leaving any survivors at the mercy of rough seas and deep water. In 1991, a group of treasure hunters seemed to have finally solved the puzzle when they stumbled upon the watery graves of five World War II-era Avengers near Fort Lauderdale. Unfortunately, it was later found that the Hawks belonged to a different group of Navy planes whose serial numbers didn't match those of the fabled Lost Patrol. Many believe the wrecks of Flight 19 and its doomed rescue plane may still lurk somewhere in the Bermuda Triangle, but while the search continues to this day, no definitive signs of the six aircraft or their 27 crewmen have ever been found. 5. What happened to the Bloodfoot flag? The case of the Bloodfoot is a curious one, seeing as the actual existence of the legendary and sacred Nazi flag has been disputed, never mind what became of it. Supposedly the swastika flag, designed by Hitler himself, became such a key Nazi symbol when a white flag bearing the symbol, in the center was carried and then covered in blood, during Hitler's attempted Beer Hall Putsch in Munich in November 1923. Carried by the SA, they were halted by Munich police, and placed the flag on this floor, before some Nazi blood was shed on it during the result in armed conflict. In the most often used version of the events of the Bloodfin flag, supposedly the wounded flag bearer Heinrich Trambeer gathered up the blood-soaked relic, ran off to a friend's house and then hid it in his jacket. Then Hitler was allegedly given the flag, now attached to a new staff with a decorative finial and silver sleeve commemorating the 16 Nazis that died during the Beer Hall Putsch, after being released from Landsberg prison. When the National Socialists staged the Munich Putsch, on November 9, 1923, one of the leading units in the staff column was the 6th Company of Sturm Abte Ilung, PSA, Regiment Munchen, recently awarded its own swastika flag. The 6th Company commander had appointed Saman Heinrich Trambeer to carry the unit colors on the march. As the column reached the Feldherrn, the uniformed police blocking the route raised their rifles and opened fire on the National Socialists. Marching next to flag bearer Trambeer was an SA activist called Andreas Bordel. Bordel was mortally wounded by the first volley of rifle fire, and collapsed on top of Trambeer who had thrown himself onto the ground as soon as the police began shooting. The flag was trapped under the body of the dying Bordel, and it was already covered in blood. Heinrich Trambeer dragged the flag free and desperate to escape arrest or worse scrambled to his feet and carrying the flag, ran back up the street and disappeared into the narrow side streets. Trambeer saw it as his duty to save the flag from being seized, by the authorities and took shelter in the house of a friend, Herr Ziegler. Together they stripped the flag from its pole and Trambeer left the house with the folded flag hidden inside his coat. Ziegler hid the flagpole in his house. The blood-stained flag was taken from house to house and hidden by different NS men and women in Munich until 1926, when it was returned to Adolf Hitler personally by SA activist Karl Leggers. The flag was now awarded a special status as a surviving relic of the November 9th Putsch. In addition, the fabric of the flag bore the damage of bullet holes from the shooting and was stained by the blood of at least one of the Munich martyrs. 
The flag was named the Blifa the Blood Flag. The damage was never repaired and never cleaned. Adolf Hitler arranged for a special flagpole to be designed for it, with the silver sleeve around the staff carrying the names of three of the Munich dead who had belonged to the 6th Company of Sir Regiment Mugen. At an staff rally in the city of Weimar on July 4, 1926, the few represented the blood flag to the recently formed SS and its standard bearer was Heinrich Trambeer, now a member of the SS marked out as a survivor of the Munich Putsch and later awarded the honor of Alt Kampfer. From 1927 until the outbreak of the Second World War, the blood flag was always used in the rituals of consecrating new banners and standards for the staff, SA and SS. All newly awarded standards were touched by the flag cloth of the blood flag, thereby connecting the new colors with the sacrifice of the men of November 1923. The ceremony was always conducted by Adolf Hitler himself. The blood flag was held by the standard bearer and the Führer took the cloth in his right hand to perform the ritual of consecration. The original standard bearer Heinrich Drambeer had by now become increasingly unwell, after suffering a fractured skull and other serious injuries in a street battle with communists. The honor and role of standard bearer of the blood flag was passed, to another and staff veteran of the Munich SS and close comrade of Drambeer, Jacob Grimminger. From around 1929 onwards, Jacob Grimminger acted as standard bearer until the end in May 1945. The blood flag always had place of honor at rallies and ceremonies across the 1930s, and when not being carried, in public was always stored on public display at the national offices of the Nstaff in Munich, the Brown House. Mystery surrounds the fate of the blood flag. After late 1944 slash early 1945, all historical sources agree that in late 1944, the Blutfen was removed from the Nstap headquarters, the Brown House in Munich to a safer place, then according to some sources, was moved again in the early spring of 1945. After the collapse of the Third Reich in May 1945 this most important, symbol of German National Socialism disappeared. Certainly the Allied occupation forces were keen to track it down, and the standard bearer Jacob Griminger was interrogated several times, by American military intelligence personnel about the location of the blood flag, an element of post-1945 mythology grew up around, the hiding place of this iconic NS banner, one American writer suggested that it was hidden away in South America, smuggled out by U-boat with other meaningful treasures of the Nstap and locked away in a bank vault in San Diego, Chile. In the myths and rumors about the fate of Reich's leader Martin Bormann, some journalists and fantasists claim the flag was taken to South America by Bormann, and hung on the wall of his secret hideout in the jungles of Paraguay. Elements of the film The Boys from Brazil and Too Much Imagination The writer of this blog was once told by a former Waffen-SS officer, that the Blattwein was certainly not in South America, but was safe in a secret place either in Germany or Austria, but he refused to say anything more about it. A former member of the Hitler Youth told the author, that he had been told by an altar camp for that the Blattwein was safe in Europe and its location was known only to a trusted few and their descendants. In the post-war years, a number of wealthy private collectors of Third Reich memorabilia have tried unsuccessfully to track the flag down, motivated by a combination of personal interest and financial considerations. There is no doubt that if the blood flag was to emerge onto the collector's market it would fetch a huge price in the auction rooms, however, the blood flag has far more meaning to what some call the true believers, than a sale room price tag. Of course there are also those elements who would seek out the blood flag to either spirit it away for permanent display in the museum at Yad Vashem in Israel or else seize it and publicly destroy it as a symbolic triumph over National Socialism. One day perhaps, when sanity has been restored to European politics, the Blattwein will be taken out of hiding and will return to Munich to be displayed with honor. The Northland Forum would be interested to hear of any other accounts of the blood flags that are circulating out there. 6. Pearl Harbor's Missing Pilot Numerous tales of supposed ghost planes spotted during World War II exist, 
but perhaps the most freaky and spy-tingling is the P-40 fighter that allegedly returned to U.S. soil a full year after the Pearl Harbor attack. On December 8, 1942, U.S. radar picked up an unaccounted-for plane heading straight for American soil from Japan, with many fearing a new type of attack or diversion from the Axis powers. In order to determine what was happening, two fighter planes flew up alongside the UFO and reported back that it was a P-40 not used since the defense of Pearl Harbor a year previously. What was even more bizarre was that the landing gear was completely disabled, the plane had bullet holes in the side, and the pilot was covered in fresh blood and slumped forward in his cockpit. The pilot then waved moments before the flight nosedived towards the ground and crash landed. Yet when the wreckage was analyzed, there was no trace at all of any pilot, and a diary was discovered that claimed the plane had come from the island of Minden now, 1,300 miles into the Pacific Ocean. If the pilot had crash-landed on the island following the Pearl Harbor attack, then how did he survive for a full year? How did he get the plane off the ground without a landing gear? Why did he have fresh blood on him, and what happened to his body? Extremely freaky, isn't it? 7. The List of British Soldiers at Auschwitz In a mystery that only came to light more than 60 years after the end of World War II, in 2009 a list was discovered during excavations at Auschwitz concentration camp, that held the name of 17 British soldiers, who are believed to have been POWs. With surnames including Osborne, Lawrence, and Gardiner on the list, eight of the 17 British names had ticks next to them. Some believe this refers to the fact that eight of them had been successfully executed along, with many other British soldiers from E-715 camp, but others are not as convinced. German words since then, never, and now also appear on the list, and this has led many to the conclusion that the men were in fact members of the British SS division, who fought alongside the Nazis and the Axis powers against the Allies during World War II. Neither theory has been proven conclusively, but the secrecy of the list suggests something is not quite right about it. The details, which were found during routine preservation work at the concentration camp, has puzzled researchers who have no clue how it came to be there. Experts are divided over the list with some claiming the names belong to former Jewish prisoners of war who were sent to die at the camp. Others say they could have belonged to a British SS division that fought alongside the Nazis in World War II. Polish authorities are now seeking to gain access to British archives in a bid to help solve the mystery. The document is a piece of white celluloid with 17 surnames handwritten in pencil and block letters, while a list of numbers sits on the top right-hand corner of the same page. Polish historian Dominik Sinowik, who found the document, told the Austrian Times that the list's origins was a complete mystery. Sinowik said he was looking for something else entirely, when he stumbled on the document. The Krakow-based historian found the names lying under debris inside a bunker located, on the site of the Nazi German Monowitz prisoner of war camp, which held mainly British prisoners. They were clearly the names of English soldiers, we presume prisoners of war, but we want to try and find out more about them and want British help to do so, he said. The surnames include Osborne. Lawrence and Gardiner and beside date of the 17 names is a tick. On the rear of the list somebody has written common German words with the English translations. It includes the words now, never and since then. Polish authorities have reportedly asked for permission to search search British military archives for clues about the document. Pietro Sepkwitz, an expert from the Auschwitz-Birkenau Museum, confirmed the document's authenticity. Auschwitz-Birkenau was one of the largest concentration camps in Nazi-occupied Poland, where more than a million people were killed. 90% of those who were sent to the notorious extermination camp were Jews who were gassed, starved and worked to death. Last week a separate list of Auschwitz prisoners emerged, after workers found it packed inside a bottle which was fixed in the mortar of the wall of a building. The building was part of a local high school and had served as a warehouse for Nazi camp guards. 8. The Russian Amber Room Once considered as the eighth wonder of the world, 
The Amber Room is a legendary chamber that existed in the Catherine Palace of Tsarsko Selo, near St. Petersburg. Built in Prussia in the 18th century, the room was decorated in amber panels backed with gold leads and mirrors. Following Operation Barbarossa and the German invasion of the USSR during World War II, the Wehrmacht asked curators to remove the art treasures from St. Petersburg, then Leningrad, and to disassemble the Amber Room. Due to the fact the relics in the room had dried out, they started to crumble, when they were pulled down yet, it was still transported to Königsberg in East Prussia, and displayed at the castle. In January 1945 Hitler then ordered all relics be moved from the city, although Erich Koch, who was in charge at Königsberg, fled before the Amber Room could be disassembled. Furthermore, Königsberg endured heavy bombing by the RAF during August 1945, as well as being almost completely destroyed by the Red Army in April 1945, and it is believed the Amber Room could have been damaged as a result. In the aftermath of the Second World War, various reports of people owning pieces of the Amber Room came to light, while many witnesses claimed to have seen the entire room loaded onto the German passenger ship Wilhelm Gustloff in January 1945. Despite this, two British investigative journalists determined in 2004 that the Amber Room was likely destroyed during the bombing raids on Königsberg Castle, although this has not been proven. Interestingly, However, the Soviet government commissioned a replica of the Amber Room, to be built in 1979 at Tsarsko Selo. Taking 24 years to complete, it is now available to be viewed, while a miniature Amber Room also exists in Klimakno near Berlin. 9. Rommel's Underwater Treasure German Field Marshal Erwin Rommel was one of the most high-profile Nazi generals during World War II, and he was so dedicated to the state that he attempted to hide treasure, when he began to fear the worst during 1944. Supposedly, Rommel gave four SS divers six steel ammunition boxes containing German treasure, including 440 pounds gold bullion, silver, precious stones, artwork, and jewelry, and they buried it somewhere under the sea. Although no one is entirely sure of its whereabouts, Many believe it is in one of the many underwater caverns located off the eastern coast, of the Mediterranean island of Corsica. In all, it is believed the treasure would be worth at least pound 20 million, and that is a conservative estimate. British investigators claim to have discovered a code on the back of a photograph of a German soldier with his parents, and they believe this could lead them to Rammel's treasure. The coordinates suggest it is located just off Murano Beach which is less than a mile from the Corsican port of Bastia. This mystery could be close to being solved some 70 years on, after all, 10. Who turned Anne Frank in? Everyone knows the tragic story of Anne Frank, the German Jew who was captured and killed, during the Holocaust at Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, but not before she wrote a diary, while in hiding in Amsterdam that came to light in July 1945. From her family, only her father, Otto Frank, survived the war and this tragic tale has asked an important question ever since, who made the anonymous phone call, that told the Gestapo about their hiding place in a secret annex, or actor who is, above the so-called Anne Frank house, and shot them. Various suspects have been suggested over the years with the most often blamed being Willem van Meren, who was a warehouse manager. When allegations were made towards Van Meren, however, all potential witnesses had died, including Julia Stettman the Nazi officer who received the phone call. Another suspect is longtime friend of Otto Frank, Tony Allers. Allers' son Anton helped in the creation of a biography of Otto Frank in 2002, and he claimed his father had indeed reported the family to the Gestapo. Lena Hartog van Bladeren, a cleaning lady may also have turned over the family because she feared her husband would be arrested and she is known to have testified that Jews had lived in the property. In addition, other employees in the warehouse that became Anne Frank House also revealed in a 1948 investigation that they knew the family were hidden in the secret annex, meaning they are certainly suspects as well. 
Detman committed suicide in the immediate aftermath of Germany's surrender, meaning that no conclusive proof could ever be found as to who made the phone call. The person who betrayed Anne Frank and her family will almost certainly never be determined, it seems.